Hello again, Blender Heads. This is Jamie Dunbar from Dragon Boot Studios, and welcome to the final lesson in the Sculpting Score Bunny series. In the last lesson, we created fur for our little Score Bunny character here and rendered it out in Eevee. So if you're interested in learning how to do um, grooming with fur in Blender, make sure that there is a link in the description to the previous video. But in this lesson, I'm going to be showing you how to set up essentially this same first system, but using cycles. Now I have to admit, when I first conceived of this tutorial, I thought that setting up fur in cycles was going to be a little bit more complicated. There's going to be, you know, four or five major settings that would have a, a significant difference on the render. And it turns out that it's really, really easy. Like, you have no idea. Fur used to be this really challenging thing to get right in 3D, and it's just, it's so simple now. So I'm going to throw in a couple of extra little things so that you can get the most out of this tutorial. Let's dive in, and uh, let's start by switching over to cycles here. So the first major difference is going to be under our hair settings, under our, uh, our scene settings here. And you can see that compared to Eevee, we get some very slightly different settings here. They, they kind of do some very similar things. Uh, so you've got the choice between ribbons and thick. And the difference between that is basically, let's just isolate this. If you were to be using ribbons, your fur would kind of be like that on um, little, little triangles or on little planes. And if you were to choose thick, it would be like using an actual cylinder. So using thick here will actually add some thickness, some actual depth to your fur. It does take a little bit longer to render, but you will get some slightly more realistic results. Considering this is a cartoony character, you can probably get away with using ribbons and maybe save a little bit of render time. Personally, I would like going for a little bit more realism, so I'm going to stick with thick here. It's probably worth having cull back faces on, which is just on by default. That basically means that anything that is behind the model won't get rendered and will therefore save us a little bit of render time. And then the other thing that uh, we have to change here is our primitives. Kind of got three choices here. Triangles will basically use polygons, kind of like we, uh, we had before with the flat plane. The line segments will be kind of like it's using a path with, with a little bit of extrusion to it, but those, those segments will kind of go from A to B. They, it won't add any additional curvature to it. Whereas in if we use curved segments, you will get your, your hair will just be that little bit smoother. So I'm gonna go with curved segments. Again, this will add a little bit of render time, probably not too much. And because our fur is so short here, we can probably set this to about two. If uh, Score Bunny here had you know, long flowing locks like Rapunzel or something, you'd probably want to up this to something a little bit higher, but in our case, we're going to go for something quite low. In terms of the setting on the actual fur itself, if we just jump over to here and kind of choose any of these, let's just go with the, with the face. Our settings are going to be basically identical to what we were using in Eevee. The only thing that you might want to consider changing is your hair shape. Um, the, the diameter for your hair, you can kind of up this or lower it depending on how thick you want the hair to be. In my case I'm going to try and um, leave it at the two centimeters. I think that kind of works well for our model. And we have one last change that we can make here and this is probably the the biggest change and that is going to be our materials. So if I just drop over to our shader editor here you can see that uh, on our score bunny fur material um, we were using the principled uh, BSDF and that's because the principled hair BSDF shader doesn't work in Eevee, at least not yet. So we, uh, we had to go with something a little bit more default. Now that we're using cycles, we can actually utilize the, uh, the power on this. So I'm going to go and reconnect this and disconnect our principled here. Let's just quickly go over a couple of the settings here. So first off, we've got our drop-down menu here. We've kind of got three different options. Now the absorption coefficient here is, uh, is a much more... Um, I suppose scientific values in here. And unless you've got some really specific purposes to be using this, I I'd largely be avoiding it. Uh, the other one is melanin concentration, and this is for um, much more realistic hair. So this works really, really well for human hair. Probably works quite well for more realistic animals, like, I don't know, bears and wolves or something. Because um, the melanin concentration here will go from, uh, I believe zero gives you white hair, and as you scale it up, you get blonde, brown hair, all the way into black hair and then the melanin redness here will determine whether or not your character is a redhead. The problem with this is that it's really hard to get some sort of crazy characters. So if I just go over to wireframe, let's hide this. You can see that we've got yellow and orange in here for Score Bunny. 
And um, those are obviously some fairly drastic colors that you don't usually see in nature. So all of this melanin concentration is going to be really good for realistic hair. We don't have realistic hair. So in our case, our only really option here is to use the direct coloring. And you can see I've already got the, um, the uh, diffuse map from Score Bunny's body here plugged into the direct coloring. Now the roughness, as you would expect, is very similar to the principled shader here. The more we crank it up, the, uh, the less shiny our hair will get. But you'll notice here that we've kind of got two slightly different um, roughness values here. Uh, that, that kind of refers to... Let me just get this in here so we can kind of use this as an example. So the roughness here kind of refers to um, the shininess value going up and down the hair, whereas in the radial roughness, as one might expect, refers to going across it or around the, uh, the hair. So depending on what you need, you might need to tweak these values ever so slightly. In our case, Score Bunny is kind of a, he's a character that runs around quite a bit, probably kicks up a fair bit of dust and dirt particles. I think he's going to have reasonably rough fur, so I'm going to kind of crank these up a little bit. I'm going to go with, let, let's go with about 0.75. Now the coat here refers to, say, if you had uh, gel or water in your hair. If you were to crank this up, you'd get a slightly shinier appearance. S similar to roughness, except the roughness kind of refers to the, the hair itself. The coat refers to something that's on top of the hair. IOR is the index of refraction that refers to light actually bouncing into the hair and bouncing out of it, uh, kind of very similar to glass, how light can bounce in and then refract out in a slightly different way. Hair does a similar thing. The offset is getting really technical. If you go and look at hair under a microscope, you can see it's kind of got this uh, weird scaling on it. Uh, and the offset here refers to just how dense that scaling is. And this will also have a little bit of effect on uh, how rough the, the hair appears. I think in our case, we can certainly set that to, uh, or leave that at default. The random roughness, again, kind of tweaks these, but does it on a per hair basis. So I think it's worth adding just a little bit to this. Let's maybe go 0.25. Considering Score Bunny here is white, we probably won't see a great deal of difference. But um, if you say had a character with black fur, this would definitely be worth playing with. And finally, the random value here refers to the, the color on individual hairs. So it might be worth, say, plugging a ramp into this. Um, plugging a color ramp or something into this. So that then you could get a bit of variation between white fur all the way down to black fur. Um, now I've kind of played with this with Score Bunny a little bit. It just kind of makes his fur look dirty. Uh, but this would be really good if you say had a, a human that was a slightly older character. You wanted to add little grey hairs and tufts in to make them um, give them that kind of salt and pepper look. Uh, in our case, I'm not going to play with that. So that's kind of it in, in terms of our overall settings. Um, so I'm going to give this a little test render and uh, I'll come back to show you some results. Okay, we're back after our render. And as you can see, I've got my old render from Eevee over on this side and I've got our new render from Cycles over on this side. And I just kind of want to do a, a quick little comparison between the two. So first of all, worth noting that this one took nearly five minutes to render, and I don't actually have the time on this one, but from memory, I, I think it was about 30 seconds or something. So there's a big difference in render time. And if you don't need the extra detail from cycles, then it's it's probably worth um, sticking with Eevee. Like these results are, I mean, considering this is real time, these results are amazing. But there are a couple of subtle differences on cycles that are, are possibly worth it. Like, I mean, I just love this, um, this light passing through the fur on the ears that we're getting, this backlighting, I mean, that's just, that's gorgeous. We are getting a little bit of it in Eevee over here, but it's its much, much nicer. And that's because of the fur shader, the, the hair shader that we're using now um, that allows the, the light to kind of pass into and out of the fur in a more realistic fashion. You can also see we're, we're getting better rim lighting in the armpit here and around the, uh, and around the, side of the arm on the fingertips really noticeable on the on the feet like we almost lose the definition in the toes on uh, on ev whereas in we pick it all up in cycles i'd say the only downside is if we kind of zoom in on the face a little bit here you can see that this ev has kind of come out a little bit cleaner whereas in the fur here is just it's starting to look a little bit dirty and that that's because in cycles you get more realistic shadows than casting onto onto the mesh here which, so this is more realistic, but it's also looking a little bit dirty. So I might see if we can't um, if we can't fix that up a little bit. 
So let's jump into some slightly more advanced things just to make this render, I mean it's already popping, but let's make it really pop. So first of all, the big difference between EV and Cycles is bounced light. Now you can technically fake bounced light in EV, but takes a little bit of additional setup, whereas in Cycles does it automatically. Whereas if you go back to our scene here, you can kind of see that Squirrel Bunny is just really sitting in a void. So although Cycles technically can do light bounces, in this instance it's not, because we don't have anything for the light to bounce off. So I'm going to create a little room for him here which will then allow the, uh, the light to bounce a little bit more. And if I just swap this back over to our render result, it might allow us to clean up some of these darker shadows that we're getting here. It'll lighten him up just a little bit. So I'm just gonna go and create a cube. Let's um, drop over this to wireframe so I can see a little bit better. Let's make sure that the uh, bottom of the cube is actually on the ground plane here. And you can see that our feet aren't quite set perfectly. I might just go in and tweak that in a minute. But let's just... And you see there's where the, uh, the wall is. And actually I think that's in quite a nice spot. What I will do is just add a bevel to this cube. Because otherwise we're going to get some dark lighting in there. And I kind of want it to uh, be more of a gradient as it goes up the wall. So I'm just going to go and add a bevel modifier. And just add a few additional segments. About six or so should do. And I might just make that offset a little bit bigger so that that ramp is a little bit more broad. Somewhere about there should be nice. And just make sure that you go smooth shade or you'll get some weird artifacts in your lighting. And I'm also just going to go in and just sculpt his feet a little bit more so that they fit a little bit better. So I'm just gonna go into sculpt mode, uh, clear that mask because we don't want that one. Now I want to select uh, kind of this entire leg here and just drag it down a little bit. So to do that, I'm going to go to my lasso tool, select a chunk of the foot here. Now the reason I'm doing this is because if we tried to select the whole leg here, we're going to select the other foot, and that's going to cause us some grief. So if I just kind of select, I can go a little bit further, select a big chunk of the foot there, I can then hit A to bring up um, my masking menu here, and if I just go grow mask, you can see that we can grow it up the leg. Uh, if you hit shift R, you can just repeat that last action we can grow that up there a little bit. Now I can kind of go in and select that a little bit more nicely. So something about there should be nice. Might just grow that a little bit further and then go and smooth my mask a couple of times. Invert it and now we should be able to just grab the grab tool and shift that foot down until it just penetrates the foot just a tiny little bit. And in fact, we can probably just use the normal grab tool now and just pull that side of the foot up. Just a smidge. Let's go and clear the mask using Alt-M. And I don't think I'll need to use the uh, masking tools for this. I think I can just kind of grab that part of the foot and bring it down a little bit and then just maybe go underneath the ground and lift it slightly up. I might even just separate those just a little bit more. Okay, there we go, that's kind of fixed up our pose. One last thing that I'm going to do with this, um, with this box here is when I render this, I still want Score Bunny here to be on a, a transparent background. And if we render right now, uh, we're obviously going to get this cube in the render and we're going to lose our alpha channel here. So instead, I'm going to go over to our object properties over here and scroll down to visibility. And I'm going to turn on shadow catcher. In fact, if I just drop over into um, rendered mode here. This is all very bright. We might actually, now that we've got all this bounced lighting bouncing all over the place, we may need to just tweak our lighting a little bit. But you can see that we're getting the background here, and if I turn on shadow catches, that all disappears, but we still maintain all of our bounced light. And if you look closely here, you can see that there is in fact still a shadow underneath his feet. So this will be a little bit nicer. Now I'm just going to go and tweak our lighting just a little bit. We've only got the four lights to play with here, so I'm just going to start by turning them all off. And now we can kind of work on them one at a time. So this one here is kind of our fill light off to the side. I actually kind of like that one as it is. This one over here is our key light. 
so it's a little bit brighter, but I think now it's gone and got itself a little bit too bright. So I'm just going to come in and drop this to, let's try maybe three. No, I think even that's still too strong. Let's try one. How low can we make this go? Oh, whoops, I've, I've still got the other light selected. Hang on, leave that one at five. Yeah, that's a bit more like it. Okay, so drop this to maybe ten. Yeah, I think that's going to be okay. And these two will be our backlights. Okay, so this is really, really strong. You can see that even though it's technically behind Squirrel Bunny here, it's still lighting all of the front. That's because it's really, really strong with 56 here. So let's drop this. Let's let's start by halving it, perhaps. And that's looking a little bit better. I might even still go a bit lower. Let's try, let's try about 20. We're still getting nice rim lighting there, but we're not getting nearly as much color uh, light bouncing on the, off the off the front wall back onto Squirrel Bunny's face. So I think that'll be okay. And this one is just a when you combine these two, you kind of get the fill or the, or the rim light on the ear here, and we just needed another little light to uh, extend that rim light down the face there, just to pop it out from the background. So again, I think this one's still a little bit bright. Let's maybe drop it down to about eight, maybe six. Okay, and I think that's not looking too bad. Let's just turn all of these lights on and just have a quick look. And I, I still think we're it's, everything's just a little bit bright here. So again, let's just kind of go through and just drop everything just a little bit. Okay, so I played around a little bit more with the, with the lighting until I got something that I was happy with. And I think this is starting to look pretty good. The one thing that I am noticing, now that we're getting a little bit more detail out of cycles, I'm starting to see that the fur around the eyes and the lips just isn't quite as dense as I would like it. So I am just going to go back in here and um, let's turn the face fur back on so we can see this and uh, I might just isolate that. I'm just going to go in and tweak our weight paint on the, uh, hang on, we need to go to face on our vertex groups. Just make sure that you don't accidentally paint on the, uh, the band-aid there. And you can always just go and remove it from uh, your vertex group if it gets to be a little bit of a problem. Okay, so I think that that should fix our face up. The last thing that I'd like to do is just do a little bit of compositing because I'm just not quite getting as much detail out of this fur as I would like. So what we're going to do is add ambient occlusion to this so that we can get a little bit more detail in the fur. You can see in Eevee we kind of get it for free, but uh, in Cycles we kind of have to go and add it. So if we just jump over to our view layer properties here, all we need to do to get the ambient occlusion is to turn on the ambient occlusion. Now, one thing, I did do a little bit of testing with this before, and when I initially did this, uh, I just ended up with a, a black outline, which really wasn't all that helpful. And I realized that that's because under our world settings here, ambient occlusion, for some reason I've got this distance on our ambient occlusion set to like a kilometer. And that's just going to be way, way too big. We want this set down to around about a centimetre uh, for our scene here. Now, you don't need to turn on the ambient occlusion here. You just need to tweak the distance, and that will uh, affect this setting here. Now, the last thing that I want to do is turn on our denoising data. This is the Intel denoiser. And I've just started turning this on by default because it's kind of freaking amazing, and I can sort of halve my render times by using this. So I'll show you how to set this up as well. So make sure you've got denoising data and your ambient occlusion turned on. Go and set your samples to something reasonable. In this case, I'd say you want at least 256. I'm going to jump up to 512, just so we've got a little bit more detail. And I'm going to set up one last little render here, and then I'll show you how to do the compositing. All right, we're back again with a final render over here. So now we're just going to do a little bit of compositing. I'm going to jump over here to our compositor. Make sure you've got use nodes checked if you don't already. And uh, as you can see, this is our final render here. Um, I'm going to make sure that I've got the viewer node enabled here and just go over to viewer node. And um, if you don't already have one of these, I'll just delete this. You can hold down uh, control and shift and click on your render layers here and it'll just create one for you. And uh, if you hold down shift and click and then click again and again and again, you can kind of get down to your different nodes as you go. So here you can see we've got our ambient occlusion. That looks like it's worked reasonably nicely. Uh, so the first thing we want us to do is set up our denoising. So I'm just going to go back to our main image here. So you can, I don't know whether you'll be able to see this on YouTube, but hopefully you can see there's a little bit of noise um, going through our render here, particularly, you can see it particularly on the eyeballs. It's a little hard to see it on the fur just because 
we've already got so many different strands and stuff going through here. But I think you can definitely see it on the eyeball. So I'm just gonna go and add a denoise node in here and stick this between our viewer and uh, image node. And you can already see that's cleaned it up quite a lot. If I just kind of swap back and forth, give it a split second. And that's doing a pretty good job of cleaning that up. But we can make it a little bit more accurate. All we need to do is plug in our denoising normal and our denoising albedo. And then it just kind of magically takes care of the rest. So you can see that was our original. And this is now our, uh, our final. And that's uh, significantly smoother. Hopefully you can see that. It's making a big difference on my screen anyway. Okay, so we've got that in there, and we've possibly, you know, denoising, you always lose a little bit of detail, so let's see what we can do about adding it back in. So let's add our ambient occlusion. I'm just going to go and create a mix node, stick that after our denoising here, go and plug our ambient occlusion into the bottom layer here, just space this a little bit more nicely, and set this to multiply. As you can see, that gives us lots and lots of detail, except now we've made it a very dirty fur. So we can obviously dial this uh, in and out, depending on how much detail we want. So somewhere around about 0.5 is probably not working too badly for me. But we can also push this a little bit further if I go and create a color ramp and stick that between our ambient occlusion and multiply node. If we just go and uh, check in on this, we can sort of crunch these uh, blacks and whites down a little bit. So we can really kind of strip away a little bit of that and make that a little bit uh, a little bit harsher. So maybe somewhere about there's not too bad. Now when we go back here, we get a little bit more fine control. So we can go with completely off, completely on, and I'm gonna guess somewhere around about 0.65 is, is looking pretty good. Maybe just a little bit too strong. I might still just drop it down to 0.5. We're just getting a little bit too much through the face here. So I'm reasonably happy with that. Um, one last little thing that I'm going to add, I'm just gonna add a little vignette to this just to, just to kind of draw our focus towards his face here. So to do that, all we need to do is go to our little search menu here and type in mask, and we want an ellipse mask in this case, which is this big box here. Let's just shuffle these across a little bit further. Oh, good grief, there we go. And we're going to want uh, another mix node. Again we will set this to multiply. Now I just like bringing this up kind of by itself because it's a little bit easier to see. So to make this work you use the uh, the width to scale it in and out obviously on the X and Y or width and height in this case. So we want to go somewhere around about there and then we want to add a little bit of blur so we'll put this through a blur node and just crank up our X and Y, let's go with, let's try, how does 20 go? Now we want to go a lot higher than 20, so let's just, I think about 200 is probably okay. So now we will plug that into our multiply node up here. As you can see, we can get this uh, these dark edges going around the, uh, the corner of our image, and we can uh, kind of enable and disable those by just hitting M, and you can see exactly where it's getting to. So I think I might make this a little bit smaller, just so that black kind of comes in a little bit further. About 1.2. I think that's looking all right in terms of our distance from the edge. It's obviously far too dark though, so let's try maybe 0.5. And let's just kind of enable and disable this. Yeah, there we go. I think that's good. One last little thing that I might do is just go and add a curves node. I just want to brighten him up just that little bit. And then kind of put this just about anywhere in our image, but I'm gonna go and add it before the vignette. So I'm gonna go and put it, actually I'm gonna put it even before we add the ambient occlusion. So I'm gonna stick it between our denoise and our multiply over here. And I might just select this so I can see it by itself. And just kind of turn that up a little bit. I don't wanna to go too high. Just add a little bit of additional contrast. Don't wanna make those darks too dark. Just kind of want to make particularly his face just that little bit whiter. All right, and finally, just want to plug that into our composite node, so that this will now show up regardless of whether we use the uh, the render result or the viewer node. 
There we go. It just took a split second to uh, to load up. So uh, there we go. Hopefully you've enjoyed this score bunny tutorial. I will see you next time with something completely new. Until then.